So basically, we'll talk about a subject, simple subject. I cannot talk like Dr. Orange with the most sophisticated uh, research that he has, but I will give you something that you can maybe use in your daily things. So I get a lot of questions. When do I refer to you, Dr. Suleiman? When can we refer to you? Do I need to refer a free heart murmur? Do I need to refer this? Do I need to do that? What's going on here? So I want to show you how we can work on this uh, together. So there is no disclosure. <clears throat> so our objective is uh, common referrals that will, and then the, we will talk about red flags that are very important for you to keep in your mind. And then review of some murmur chest pain, syncope. I'm not going to talk a lot about syncope or chest pain because Dr. Anas will be talking about them thoroughly. So I don't need to go uh, through this. And then we'll talk also briefly about EKG. Dr. Ala already gave you yesterday a good idea about EKG. So and then we'll talk about some take home messages. So why congenital heart disease we care about it? Because it's basically the most congenital anomalies. 50% of the children with congenital anomalies, they will have a congenital heart disease. And it's the most common cause of death from congenital anomalies, especially the first year of life. So from this point of view, it becomes very important. Every single child that you may lose him, and at the same time, you can save him and he can survive and have a reasonable good life. So. <clears throat> Uh, it's generally a heart disease about 1% overall, but we believe that uh, you can add to it by cuspid aortic valve and some other thing. There is a lot of uh, classification, and I'm not going to talk about the classification, the cyanotech, acyanotech, and left to right, right to left, and all of this. This is not the subject of this talk. <clears throat> so this is what we'll try to go uh, uh, quickly in the next 20 minutes or so. So we'll talk about little murmur, chest uh, pain, syncope. Kawasaki disease, palpitation, genetic syndromes, abnormal EKGs, and surgical school. This is the main reason why people refer to pediatric cardiology. So if you look at this list, you will find something that you should refer to pediatric cardiology with a good reason. Not every single patient with chest pain needs to be referred. So bad way for proper referrals, you need to have three. Actually, it's not only for pediatric cardiology. It's for everything else in life. For any other specialty, for pediatric, for adult cardiology, for, for hematology, for everything, you need to have three important triple A. If you have them and you know how to find them and to have the right resources for them, then you will have a good uh, uh, referral and good uh, medical care. First one, we call it availability. So when I call Dr. Ali or Dr. Muhammad, I will find him. He's available. He's not one week here and one week in another country and can't find him. So availability for any uh, subspeciality is a, a, a must for us to build. And then ability, that you, got, you have a good people who know what they are doing. So you have a person who is well-trained, well-monitored, the practice in ethical way, and so on. And then accessibility. And this is, you know, the first two, maybe we can work on it. Sometimes accessibility is really not the doctor's uh, job. And there are so many people stop in number three and that the admin people, the regulation, the law, and all of this. And sometimes this regulation that don't fit what, we, what our message for as a pediatric cardiologist or as a physician in general. So accessibility is uh, that, that three, number three of the triple A that you need to, you need to uh, have. So what's going on, uh, you know, what kind of barriers that we, we get? First of all, lack of resources. Pediatric cardiology not available. I, I'm talking about pediatric cardiology. And then last, lack of equipment. You have uh, the pediatric cardiology, but the hospital doesn't want to buy the new echo machine. They have something like 15 years ago, and then the, the billing is the same. Either you use the 20 years old machine, or you use the machine that was, you know, you bought just yesterday. So the insurance people don't differentiate between them, and the, 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 the admin usually, they will try to save money in the end of the day. So care offered by not properly trained physician, and sometimes you get pediatric cardiology, and that we see at the time, you see adult cardiology trying to do something, you see somebody who went for five days training an echo, and then he think it's okay, I'm gonna start doing my own echoes and so, stuff like that. So this is not properly trained. And then congenital coverage, and this is related to the insurance uh, problem. So uh, until, you know, many of the insurance will always try to avoid congenital coverage. And in pediatric cardiology, most of the time when I have a child, a heart murmur as an example, um, and then we apply for the, the insurance, they give the first time because it's heart murmur. And then when I see the patient, I have to say what's, what's going on. So I say PSD, and then next time, the patient cannot see me anymore because he doesn't have coverage. 
and I cannot tell him that it's heart murmur anymore because now you have a diagnosis and its name is ventricle septal defect and this way the insurance easily for them to so especially for children we don't have currently uh, a will coverage uh, um, luckily in Abu Dhabi specifically the man honestly probably the best insurance that covering congenital anomaly in general and that's for their credit I don't think there is anybody from the man here but thank you to them so and then cost and insurances and patient compliance. So you tell the, send the patient, go there, and then you are worried about the patient. You call me, I say, okay, send the patient. I will send him after one hour because he's this, 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 this. Fine, and then the patient decide I'm gonna go home. I don't think I have a heart problem, you know, my child. The thing is, the heart doesn't talk. So it's inside organ. And does it, you know, if you have runny nose, everybody in this room will know you, will know about you, will stay away from you. But if you have ischemic heart disease and you have heart failure and you are doomed, nobody know. You can mimic like everybody else. So nobody, the, the heart is, doesn't talk. So with children, they don't complain. Oh, I have my heart, you know, I can't breathe, I can't do that. Not always an easy thing. So one of the things that, you know, this is, has this is, uh, become a mandatory here in UAE for all neonatal uh, patient. We have to do this. If you are not doing it, uh, for every single newborn baby, and I'm talking about normal baby, then you should start doing it, okay? So it's, uh, after 24 hours, we do what we call saturation screening. So we look at how much your saturation, and we wait for 24 hours in burbis because there is a lot of hemodynamic in the first 24 hours, they need to settle down. There is a transition period, we need to know what's going on after 24 hours. And this does not talk about patient in NICU, because patient in NICU, theoretically, they are sick already. I'm talking about normal baby, go to with his, sitting with his mom after delivery, he's feeding good, no problem, and now we need to discharge him. So you come as a pediatrician, you come to his room, and then you want to screen, you ask your nurse, make it sure your nurses know how to do the screening for congenital heart disease, and this is the three area. So this is the red flag. If you find any of this, you don't need to wait. This is an immediate referral. You don't need to ask your admin to allow you to send outside the hospital. Don't call the adult cardiologist. Find a properly person that who can diagnose this patient properly for you. So this is 90% or less or different between upper and uh, lower extremities, which we'll, call, we'll talk about it in, in the other place. And here is the green. So you are above 95, perfect. And you should not have more than 3% difference between upper and lower extremities. So if you have 99 up or 100 up and you have 96 in your legs, that's more than three. So it's not acceptable, it's not part of the green. You're gonna go part of this area here in the middle which is the yellow light. So in the yellow light, if you have any patient with yellow light, then you give them two hours extra waiting time, okay? Two hours, examine them after one hour and then after examine them after one hour more. So after that, if they don't declare themselves to the green, then you put them with the red. So you send them to pediatric cardiologist. This is a very important thing. In the United States, it has saved more than one-third of congenital heart disease that used to die before because we did not diagnose them. Theoretically, if you do it correctly, it can diagnose up to uh, five out of every six patients with a critical. This is meant for critical congenital heart disease, not for VSD, not for BDA, not for ESD. This is meant for congenital heart disease that BDA dependent or obstruction in the pathway. There is some stuff that we still cannot diagnose with this uh, method, and that will depend on your own physical exam. Good physical exam, good observation, good noticing for the patient will get you to the next uh, stage, and then you will have a comfortable uh, outcome when you send this patient. <clears throat> Heart murmur is everybody using the stethoscope, but not everybody know how to use it. Um, and, um, you know, we carry it in front of our patient because it's our prestige, it's our signature. They know that you are a doctor because you have stethoscope. But do they know what you are doing in your head? Nobody knows, except God. So this is the thing that we have to train ourselves how to use this machine. We are using it from the first day, maybe in medical school or the second year or third year until now. I have, I can tell you, you know, I'm not saying that this is bad or good, but we get used to the norm. So we assume everybody normal. And this is when we get ourselves in trouble, in everything in life. So I assume the heart is gonna be normal, normal first heart sound, normal second heart sound, so what's the big deal? So every, okay, I don't have time, I have 50 patients scheduled, for my schedule today, so I have to keep moving. And then that patient will fall in the crack. You know, the one percent will fall in the crack. So 
it, you will get it maybe once a year, once every six months or something like that. But this is what's going to happen to you if you don't train yourself how to say, this is the first heart sound. I have asked many, you know, what is the first heart sound? I don't know what it is. Why are you carrying the stethoscope then? What is the second heart sound? Do you know what's the, why the second heart sound have split? You know, you're supposed to know because theoretically you are using it 50 times. You should hear the second heart sound. Or you should say, this is the second heart sound, this is the aorta, and this is the pulmonary. Do you know where to listen to them? This is the normal anatomy for the uh, body. So this is the, in the front, this is my right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and this here is going to be my tricuspid, my uh, pulmonary valve. So the pulmonary valve is in the left, and the aorta in the back, and it's in the right. So when you listen to the aorta and the pulmonary, then you should listen to them in the opposite direction of what you think in your head. And when you want to listen to the split, you have to listen in the area where there is less noise. So the aorta is very noisy. Don't listen in the aorta because you're not going to hear the split. Does anybody know why we have split? You know? Oh, good doctor. Why, why do we have split? So you have more filling in the right ventricle. Smart doctor, what else? So what happens when you have more blood in the right side? Reduce, so you have to increase your heart rate. And you'll see that in your AKG as well, it will match. And we'll talk about it later. So a split of the second heart sound is important because of one single disease that I want every single pediatrician in this room to go out comfortably and say, I'm going to diagnose that. Do you know which disease I'm talking about? SD. Everybody know. I'm, I'm very impressed. So murmur, you're going to hear it. So OK, what, but what is this murmur? Is it normal? Is it not abnormal? Is, what, do, what do I need to do with it? So from that point, you can use the split of the second heart sound, especially in older children. And small children, because of the fast heart rate, you may not be able to recognize the real, especially in neonate. I don't want you really to. <clears throat> to have that. <clears throat> so what is the heart murmur in general? Basically blood moving. So either the road, turbulence, basically turbulence, no more, no less. Either the road is wide open or wide closed or there is more blood coming in or going out. So this is basically the heart murmur. It doesn't, it's not a disease. So many patients, when you tell them, hey, you, your child have a heart murmur, they will think it's, it's a bomb inside the chest. It's gonna explode in their own child. So we have to assure them that this is a sound, and we will have either, you know, I will follow you, which is difficult in this country really because the follow-up system does not go to one single doctor. The patient keeps circling between us for two reasons. One, most of the us are just expat, and we are here for two years, and the third year we are gone, and the patient in the same way. So you are talking about 80, 90% of the population that with the very fast heart to turn over, and that doesn't give you a time to see uh, the patient again and again. And uh, primary health care is a, a, a little strange. So when I see a patient, tell him, who's your pediatrician? I don't know. OK, who sent you to me? Oh, one doctor. Where is he? On that hospital. What does he do? Is he a pediatrician? Is he an adult cardiologist? What, who's he? I don't know. Do you know his name? No. So we have to have some respect for our patient with the, when we come to our clinic. Please give them your card. And this has nothing to do with education. But let your patient know who you are. So when they ask and when they go back to remember you, you know, the card, the you know, business card is, doesn't hurt anything. So give your patient your business card, especially when you send them to someone else. Let them have your business card so when they go, they will have an idea what to do with it. <clears throat> so when you hear a heart murmur, what's the most thing important for you to decide about it out of all of this? Do echocardiography, call Dr. Suleiman, call Dr. Hamdan, call Dr. Ala, call SKMC. What do you need to do? Good physical exam. So this is the first. Good physical exam, good, you know, looking at the patient, see what I, I think now with, with our experience, I can look at the patient and I can get 90% of my information just by good looking. How's he feeding? How's he eating? How's he acting? How's he breathing? How's he moving? How's his structure? Is he in distress? Is he big or is he small? Is he failure to thrive? All of that just with one single look. You don't need really a lot of knowledge. You don't need a lot of research to learn this kind of skills. This is you practice every day. You just need to make it work in, in a proper way in your head. <clears throat> and then when we talk about, uh, you know, the heart murmur, most of us, you know, 
it's, it's really, really something that we call it a subjective uh, issue. So somebody will say one over six, and the other person will say, no, it's two over six. That's not the point. You know, you need to, the heart murmur is not a disease again. It's only one of the things that you are looking at the patient. So get to know the patient more and add the heart murmur, add the heart sound to it, add the peripheral pulses, add the saturation, add the blood pressure. Most of the pediatrician, I can tell you, your nurses, please make it sure that they do blood pressure by American Academy of Pediatrics. It's supposed to be for any patient above three years. However, if you have a suspicion and you are you know, feeling the femoral pulses and you are not doing it, you are not feeling it right, then you ask for, fem for blood pressure, even for one day old. So three years mean for normal patient, have good pulses, everything okay, I don't have, he's not obese, he's not, there is nothing for me to trigger me to go the extra mile and figure out what his blood pressure. So always add, you know, your blood pressure and your saturation. I don't know how for us as a pediatric cardiology, it doesn't matter really because when you send a patient to me, you need a little bit more than just average pediatrician visit. You need more detail. You need to tell me what is your saturation and so on. So this is the area where we can auscultate. I'm not going to review. This is probably a second year medical school stuff. So we're going to keep moving forward. <clears throat> So different uh, type of heart murmur, you know, symptoms associated with it. Again, heart murmur could be pathologic, could be innocent, and then you have different type of heart murmur that will maybe associated with symptoms. Anything associated with symptoms has become a problem. So you have to ask yourself, is this patient failure to thrive? Okay, that's fine. He has a heart murmur. It sounds innocent. No, it's not innocent. I'm sorry. Because he has something else with it. So there is what we call it red flags that you have to keep in your mind. A lot of time, I can tell you as a pediatrician, we don't ask about family history. For us, it's very, very important in pediatric cardiology. Please ask them, anybody with hypercholesteremia, anybody, do you know how often we should screen for uh, hypercholesteremia? Do you know it's mandatory for your pediatric age patient? Anybody? Huh? Do we have to screen for lipid? It's a mandatory. And I'm just saying this thing because we, we, don't, we don't take care of, you know, from two years up until 10 years, this is where the time, if you ask about family history and they tell you the family, uh, the American uh, 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 recommendation was only if you find something in the family history. That was, I think, 2008. There is a new recommendation, I think, uh, 2016 or so, and at that time they said it's mandatory for all children between two and 10. So at least once, at least once, don't screen during teenager because the turnover for lipid and so on, hormones, changes and that like that, it will come normal. So wait until they finish their teenage years and then you can repeat after 16 or 17 years old. So yes, every single child, you should have a screening for a lipid profile. And I see all the pediatrician ordering every single type of test for minimum 10 and the true through investment on the health of the child that will last for the next 50 years because he will remember you only after 50 or 40 years when he gets his first heart attack at 40 years old. Why? Because my pediatrician didn't do his job very well. So please keep in mind that lipid profile is one of the tests that you should do at least once for your own uh, child, especially when you do the liver, the glucose, the, all of this kind of tests. Get that lipid profile. Insurance will pay anyway. Good luck. So, <clears throat> red flag, failure to thrive, very important. Feeding, uh, poor feeding, no, not able to eat. You know, the most basic uh, challenge for a newborn baby is to eat and poop. That's it. Nothing, he doesn't need to go for the marathon. So if he's not doing good in this stuff, then there is some serious problem. And then respiratory problem, tachypnea, cyanosis, and all of these kind of things. And heart murmur collapse, and we're not gonna go to all of that. So basically, keep in mind any heart murmur with red flag, something not right, go to the next step. I am I, I'm in love with family history. So please, when you go home, tell your wife about the family history, how important it is. Talk to her about the lipid profile that we need to check ourselves and check our children. All right? She will be amazed with the information that you brought home. <clears throat> Exercise intolerance, high grade murmur, and all of these kind of things. This is all red flags that you should refer this patient. When you have any of this red flag, you should, you should refer. 
So this is a three, three scenarios and just a simple scenarios, really, just to bring it to your awareness. So first six months, all of them are three, six months. The first one is doing good, feeding good. There is no problem. I just heard the heart murmur one over two over six, supplementary. It's in the you know left upper left uh, uh, left upper side or right upper side. You know, but everything looks good. The physical exam looks good. Do I need to refer? Not necessary. No. However, you have to be smart how you're going to talk to the patient. And this is not something that we can write it in a book. If you tell them about it, then you are in trouble. If you don't tell them, you are also in trouble. Why? If you tell them, then they will not sleep at that night. And I have patients telling me, I did not sleep for the last week because they told me my child has a heart murmur. Make it sure when you tell them, and I, I believe you should tell the parents that there is a sound and it looked to me fine. I can see you in about two months or about one month later, no problem. Or you, you think there is something you can do better, okay? I hear a sound, go to the professional person and let him figure it out. Now it's up to me, do I need to go the extra testing or not? Do I need to do echo or not? But make it sure, because if you don't tell them, they will go to Dr. Ali next day, and they will tell, oh, your child have a heart murmur. Oh, I've been visiting this doctor for the last five years, he never say anything. And then you know what? They will lose trust in you, and they will lose trust in Dr. Ali. So you are both doomed, none of you will be smart. You think you are smart because you are inventing something that Dr. Ali didn't know. Okay, Dr. Ali, maybe no, he just decide not to tell the family. So whatever you think that the family might come back and chase you when your physical exam, don't hide. We are not parents. We are not their guardians. We are their doctors. They pay us to serve them. So they come in to you to buy some potato or some McDonald's. So you should give them a good McDonald's and a good potato, theoretically. There is no good McDonald's, by the way. But, you know, so what I'm trying to say, we are not their guardian. No, I'm not, these people look abnormal. No, be honest and straightforward. Don't hide anything in your patient, but be sensitive. Be sensitive to the culture, to their way of thinking, and whatever going on with them, just be sensitive to them. Okay, so I think you already wrote, read the, the I'm not gonna go back to it. Chest pain, Dr. Anas will talk tomorrow about a good lecture about chest pain and syncope. So this is only red flag that you can look at. He will talk about them. Anything come with exercise, always red flag. Patient tell you, I am running and I'm in the school. I always would say, chest pain, okay, fine. Is, are you resting? When I, yeah, I was like, you know, I want to go to my bed. Okay, fine, probably you are fine. But if he tell me I was running, and I was doing something and I have to stop. And when I look at my class, there are 10 of them and we run together and I'm gonna be the last one. You should say, why? Why are the last one? Are you under conditioned? Then you have to educate them for how to be good conditioned and how to exercise and so on. <clears throat> family history, family history, family history. You will see it almost on every single child uh, slide. Same could be, again, same could be mostly benign, but we have some same could be that you have always to keep in your mind that this has a red flag. So red flag, always keep thinking about them. With exercise, somebody driving with, you know, he gets syncope while he's driving, he's 20 years old. This is never normal. This is not, because when you're driving, you should be like, you know, in your tone. You have a lot of, uh, you know, you're worried somebody will hit you, some, unless you, you don't sleep at night and then, <clears throat> so emotional trigger, I, I have the best uh, uh, history for emotional triggering. I have a family with long QT syndrome and uh, her brother, uh, brothers, that, which was, she was a girl, her brother was, uh, you know, every time they come to the poop, they, uh, they hide in behind the door or something and they scare her until she collapse. She get a uh, 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 syncope. That's not normal. People don't get syncope because somebody scared them and by the door or something like that. And then she was admitted that child because she was having like a seizure and she was treated for three to four years uh, for seizure. And then luckily one time while she has a seizure, we passed by the room, not because somebody got, did an EKG before, nobody did. And we, when we look, oh, this patient, <laughs> in ventricular uh, fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, she has something else other than the, other than the seizure and it, look to, uh, it come to be long QT uh, syndrome. Palpitation, very, very common patient will, what? Get out of here. You are fired. She's my employee, so I can't do that. <clears throat> so palpitation is something that is very common. You'll hear it from uh, most of the, oh, my, his heart is going fast. So mostly benign. Do your EKG. Feel free to send it. 
to somebody to look at it. If you don't feel comfortable with reading EKG, if you don't look, you cannot understand is this normal, is it normal. You know, there's a lot of things, especially in children for EKG. Send it to your friend, somebody who's, you know, any pediatric cardiologist friend that you know, send the EKG, what do you think about this? So, you know, there's a WhatsApp, thanks, thanks to God, and currently I'm personally created four WhatsApp in the UAE. And uh, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the help, uh, of, of all of you, and I think all of you in the, in the uh, pediatric group. So send it to someone to help you to send it to Dr. Hamdan, not to me, because I, I need to take care of my own things. <laughs> okay, life threatening, arrhythmias, you know, you keep myocarditis, you know, something that you, you, somebody with arrhythmia, you have to think that this patient, why, he's 10 years, never complained of arrhythmia, now he's having arrhythmia. Myocarditis, a lot of times, just a quiet illness, doesn't necessarily come to the emergency room, but now it manifests as an arrhythmia, so you have to look at it. Hypoglycemia, poisoning, chromocytoma, and so on. So all of this is a very uh, important causes. So this is usually why we have palpitation, you know, if you scare your, uh, 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 your wife scare you and you come back late and stuff like that and you say, uh, okay, then you will have arrhythmia. But it probably it's a normal arrhythmia. So when we talk about physiologic response, it's normal, but as, as arrhythmia, I will still call it arrhythmia, so tachycardia is a form of arrhythmia, but it's a physiology. If there is a point where it can exceed that point where it become a problem. I'm gonna try to run. My wife is there, so she's watching me. So, you know, BEC is a very common thing that it's just can't somebody come early. You know, BEC is a very common, you don't necessarily to send the patient to me, except if it's frequent or the patient have symptoms. So BEC, you know, just come. It's, this is the time that where everybody should be. This one come a little bit in the early uh, time. So there is no big deal about it. It's only happened every once in the whole AKG. Make sure you look at this for arrhythmia. Not all of these others, but this one, lead two, or whatever lead you, you do. Some people lead V1, some people lead, lead two. So just make sure you are using that to look for arrhythmia. That's the best way to look for uh, arrhythmia because it gives you the whole long thing before a uh, change. Well, up, up there, you have all that will lead uh, clumped together, so you cannot uh, tell. We can actually, as you see here in this uh, picture, <clears throat> what is this here? This my slide? It is my slide. Okay, so as you see here, another form, we get it very, very common, what we call it sinus arrhythmia, okay? If you look between R and R, you will see it different in the time between them. And that's what we call it sinus arrhythmia. So when the computer, most of the computer that will read for you sinus arrhythmia, and then I get a lot of calls. I'm happy I'm getting calls, you know, I'm getting referrals, but honestly, the patient doesn't necessarily need me for that, for sinus arrhythmia. It's just a difference between the breathing that we, he just told us about, that you can basically, you know, assure the patient this is fine and you shouldn't be. Um, this is Dr. Ala, uh, last patient from Oasis Hospital, and he sent it to us. We have a small group for our pediatric cardiology group. So what do you think this patient has? Huh? What? Has heart. He has heart, yes. He has eyes, yes, the baby has eyes. What else? Huh? It's CT. So it's CT is like a garbage can. We put everything in it. But it's CT have different type. Okay? So when we say it's CT, it's what you are saying is supraventricular tachycardia. Supra? Ventricular tachycardia. So for us, SVT is like one single disease. It's not one single disease. There is more than one single disease. There is common things on it, but is this is the reentrant type or the most common type? Is this one of them? You don't know. So what do we do for this patient? What do you want me to do to diagnose this patient? And to treat. What do you need to do? Huh? Call the cardiologist? Cardiologist is not available. Huh? Well, say if I have his bag or, you know, blow or something, coughing and all of this, but it didn't work, then what is the most common medication we use? Adenosine. Do you know what's the dose? Huh? The highest dose you can get. Get 200 if you want. Get 150. Get the biggest dose you can get. And do it right. Because most of the time, the adenosine fail because we don't do it good. So you have to have to close to your heart. Adenosine have like it's a few seconds. So either, so this is what happened to this patient after Dr. Ala gave him the adenosine. So what do you think the diagnosis right now? Huh? A what? Atrial flutter. So this patient 
you know, you can give him adenosine as much as you want. He will always go to back to flutter. So what do, how did we treat this patient? This is a newborn in Oasis Hospital just a few days back. What do you think Dr. Ala did for him? Medication? No, but you can shock him actually. This patient is one single shock and he's done and he's, it's over uh, for him. Okay, so genetic problem, always look if the patient with genetic problem, always, always, this is a good reason to refer patient. You refer a lot of uh, murmur, which I'm happy with, but make it sure that if you have a Down syndrome patient, don't go home before he get an echo. And if you don't have a pediatric cardiologist inside, one minute, you are fired twice. You know, other genetic, Kawasaki disease is a very important. So, you know, you know the classic things, fever for five days plus four, but this is not what you see every day. This is what you see. There is two steps to diagnose what we call incomplete, especially for infant less than one year. All this is a very serious problem for them. So even without any other signs, only seven days of fever with nothing else. That's Kawasaki if you pass the two steps. The first step is to do inflammatory marker here. You did the inflammatory marker. If, the, if they are abnormal, the ESR and CRB, do them both. So they are normal, fine. They are not uh, normal, then you go down here. You do more inflammatory marker. You look at the liver, you look at uh, uh, blood uh, work, and you look at the urine. What you are trying to do is dig. Dig for the problem until you find out what is the actual problem for this patient. So Kawasaki incomplete, two steps, CRB and ESR, normal, bye-bye. I will follow you. I will not forget about you. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll repeat the lab. And it's abnormal, then I will go this pathway. Or I will ask for echo. This is, was, I used to still pay people, don't call me for echo for Kawasaki. Now we change. Actually, yeah, call me for echo for Kawasaki, even if he's still inpatient. Especially when you think about incomplete Kawasaki. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. <clears throat> so when to refer, this is just a kind of uh, explanation of what's going on. When to refer, when to refer, and then you have, by the time you finish referring, you're going to have your next, um, next conference, which is going to be in Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much.